Welcome to the Food Junkies Podcast. Here, we aim to provide you with the experience, strength, and hope of professionals actively working on the front lines in the field of food addiction. The purpose of our show is to educate you, the listener, and increase overall awareness about food addiction as a disease with abstinence as the solution. Here, we talk about all things recovery. Most importantly, how to thrive rather than just survive. So stay positive, make a change for yourself, tell others about your change, and hopefully the message will spread. Welcome to today's episode of the Food Junkies podcast. On today's episode, Dr. Vera Tarman and Molly Painshaw sit down with Dr. Georgia Ede to discuss how to move clients away from disease and illness and toward health, how metabolic evaluations are important to our clients, the food plans Dr. Ede prefers to use with patients, obstacles to nutritional psychiatry and nutritional interventions, her thoughts on non-nutritive sweeteners, concerns for plant-based clients, we ask about volume addiction, and Dr. Ede shares about the professional training she is offering for others in the field. Welcome, Dr. Ede. Welcome to this next edition of Food Junkies Podcast. My name is Dr. Vera Tarman, and I am your host today, along with Molly Painshaw. Today, we are talking to the notable Dr. Georgia Eid. Dr. Eid is a nutritional psychiatrist. She completed her residency in general adult psychiatry at Harvard Cambridge Hospital in 2002. By 2013, she was psychiatrist for Smith College at, in Massachusetts, where she provides nutritional consultation along with her other psychiatric services to the Smith students. Dr. Eid is the first and probably only psychiatrist to offer this nutritional consultation as an alternative to medication management. Her expertise includes the ketogenic and paleo diets along with food sensitivity syndromes. She essentially explores the power of food on brain chemistry, hormonal balance, and metabolism, and writes for websites such as Psychology Today, The Diet Doctor, and her own diagnosticdiet.com. And finally, she teaches mental health professionals all all over the world about the power of food and mental health. So welcome, Dr. Eid. Thank you very much, Dr. Tarman. It is wonderful to be here with you. Yeah, I'm so glad that we are finally connected. Can we, we always like to start with a bit of a personal take. So how did you get into this niche of nutritional psychiatry, which you essentially carved out and hopefully will start a trend with? How did you get involved with this when the regular psychiatry is so different from this? How did you find your way into this? Yeah, I definitely did not intend to go into this field. When I was in medical school, I hadn't thought about the connection between food and the brain, and it certainly was never mentioned in four years of medical school. And in four years of psychiatry residency, it wasn't mentioned either. And so it wasn't something I learned anything about. And you know, as a woman who had trouble managing my own weight since from a very young age, probably from the age of seven or eight, I only thought about food as a way to control my weight. And I never thought about how it affected the brain until in my early 40s, when I started developing, you know, all kinds of things that people associate with middle age, chronic fatigue and fibromyalgia and IBS and just migraines and all kinds of things. And, and long story short, I experimented with my diet and essentially turned my diet upside down and was able to resolve all of those problems. I hadn't been intending to try to improve my mental health. I didn't actually think there was anything particularly wrong with my mental health. You know, I got stressed or anxious sometimes, but I was really surprised at how these dietary changes improved my mental stamina, my mood, my sleep, my concentration, and my ability to bounce back from stress. I mean, it really was kind of amazing. And so that's what happened to me. I started to get really curious about the connection between diet and the brain. I wonder if dietary changes could help my patients. All of my patients were struggling with all of these things. That's how it all began. So, you know, the thing that's different about your story is that so many of us came into this field struggling with the concept of food addiction, like our struggle with food. But it sounds like you kind of stumbled into this and then discovered sort of serendipitously, oh my God, this has helped my mood, which is really good because a lot of people don't identify with uh, struggle with food, but so many people identify with issues with mental health, attention deficit, all those other things. And there you are saying, look, we don't have to just address food addicts here, we can address the whole population with food. 
So if I can just say for our audience that uh, I don't know if this came out of one of your lectures, but it was part of something that I heard you say that one in six Americans take psychiatric medications. So we're not talking about food addicts here. We're talking about the population, the depression being a number one cause of disability, even dementia on the rise. And uh, you have made this connection between standard American diet, the type of food that we eat and these disorders. So do you want to elaborate a little bit more on that? Sure. And I do think the food addiction is rolled up in that. <laughs> and yes, of course, which is why your work is so important. So I think that so there is this huge increase, some would argue that there's been a steady increase in mental health issues around the world. And we know that, as you said, one in six, at least in the United States, one in six people take psychiatric medication. That's a lot of people. And it seems to be that these problems are increasing. So when I was working in college mental health in college settings at Smith and before that at Harvard with students, it was well known in our circles, in our services, that there were more and more students coming in every year who were struggling with more and more mental health issues than the year before. And whether I was at Harvard or I was at Smith, the very, very different places One's a large university, one's a small college. They were overwhelmed. Our services were overwhelmed. People coming in crisis, people needing hospitalization, people coming onto campus as first year students, already having been hospitalized several times as teenagers, and often taking two or three psychiatric medications from the age of 18. So I can't prove to anybody that poor diet has anything to do with these trends, but these trends parallel really beautifully the increase in problems with our physical health and particularly our metabolic health, diabetes, high insulin levels, high blood sugar levels, cardiovascular disease, obesity, type 2 diabetes, all of these things, which we know are driven primarily by diet. Why should the brain be any different really? So that's, I think, a very powerful connection. And, you know, we've heard the voices of uh, Robert Lustig and Gary Tobes making those parallels so evident with metabolic health. But I think really your contribution is, hey, it's, it's mental health too. And the mental health is exploding in the same way that diabetes is. And we've got to connect these dots. So let's talk about some of the neurochemistry and the hormonal stuff. I'm probably asking too big a question, but can you in a nutshell explain how our diet can make a person more depressed or more, pick one of them, attention deficit or something, and give us the problem. And then we're going to ask about the solution after that. Yeah, sure. And so one of the things that makes the question less difficult than it might seem is that the brain is not divided into different diagnoses and different sections. You know, this is the depression area of the brain. This is, <laughs> this is the, the anxiety of the brain. It's one organ and so if we're not feeding it properly, just really about anything can happen. And what happens depends on your personal genetics and your history. But something is bound to happen if you're not giving the brain what it needs, if you're feeding it the wrong things and not feeding it enough of the right things. So in some people, that may be an attention issue. For some people, it may be mood swings. And in other people, it may be insomnia. In other people, it may be depression, et cetera. So, and we now, the research is really starting to get going in this field. There's some wonderful research going on. We're starting to understand the connection not just between nutrient deficiencies and brain health, which we've always known about, but between processed foods, high sugar diets, high insulin levels, and diets that promote inflammation. We're starting to understand how those diets damage the brain. They don't just impair the brain's ability to get energy, a constant supply of high quality energy. The brain needs lots of energy all the time, but also it damages the brain through oxidative stress, through inflammation and insulin resistance. So can you, can you give a specific on uh, maybe on how in the inflammatory process or something can make worse depression or attention deficit or Alzheimer's? Absolutely. So I could give an example for each of those categories, but one of yeah. the areas where we have the most robust and crystal clear research is okay. in the area of Alzheimer's disease. That disease, we've got decades of really high quality evidence, multiple lines of evidence from different types of science, clinical as well as research science and animal science and laboratory science showing that insulin resistance, which is just high insulin levels over time that kind of wear the body's ability to respond to insulin down over time, dulls the body's response to insulin over time. What's happening is that insulin resistance is not just correlated with, it's not just associated with, it's not just, it doesn't happen just be a coincidence that people with insulin resistance are more likely to get Alzheimer's. The evidence is very clear that insulin resistance can cause 
all of the symptoms and signs and the microscopic features of Alzheimer's disease that we are aware of. And so this has been known for a very long time. And this is why all the way back over, over 10, 15 years ago, Dr. Suzanne de Lamont at Brown University coined the term type 3 diabetes, started calling Alzheimer's disease type 3 diabetes. And what's happening there is very simple. If you have insulin resistance, your brain is being bombarded by too much insulin all the time. And what happens is over time, it becomes harder and harder for insulin to cross into the brain. And if insulin can't access the brain, if enough insulin can't get into the brain, then the brain cells cannot use glucose for energy. So you can have all the glucose and your brain can be swimming in a sea of glucose and still be starving to death if you have insulin resistance of the brain. And that's what's happening in Alzheimer's disease is the brain is literally dying. And this process is taking place over decades. It's been learned. And that would not be, so it would not be too bold to say that if you eat too much sugar or processed or refined sugar, that you are putting yourself in the path of Alzheimer's. Absolutely. You're putting yourself at very high risk for Alzheimer's. Absolutely. But what about attention deficit? How does the story play out there? Yeah. So with attention deficit disorder, is very interesting. The dietary studies we have on attention deficit are not so far, nobody has focused their research on insulin resistance or processed foods really with ADHD. But we could look at the research that we do have, which is a number of excellent studies, almost all of them conducted in Europe in the last 20, 30 years, showing that if you take children with ADHD, some of them so severe with their symptoms that they needed hospitalization, if you take those children and you put them on what's called a few foods diet or an oligoantigenic diet, this is a, like a very simplified diet of seven or eight foods. For whatever reason, the researchers chose to include a couple of foods, which I wouldn't necessarily recommend, like margarine, apple juice, white mm -hmm. rice. But other than that, it really was a whole foods diet of things like poultry and vegetables and fruit. And it didn't have any of the common allergens in it. And other than those foods I just mentioned, it didn't have any processed foods in it. And two thirds to three quarters response rate to that diet with many children no longer meeting criteria for ADHD wow. three to four weeks later. So that three to four weeks later. Important. Oh, that's incredible. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so that's a real dietary intervention to uh, so that you could potentially, I know we're going to talk more about that, but I just really want to emphasize that. So just one more, depression, how does that play out? <laughs> yes, yeah, so we're only starting to scratch the surface with depression in terms of understanding how diet and depression are related. But one of the strongest connections there is in the research between diet and depression is inflammation. And so uh, inflammation, it's not the kind of inflammation that you can see. It's not that your brain is red or sore. It's inflammation on a microscopic level. And it's the same kind you can have in the rest of your body that can cause all kinds of other chronic diseases. But the connection between diet and inflammation is this. If you're eating a very high sugar diet, if you're eating a lot of vegetable oil, if you're eating any food that irritates you, that doesn't agree with you. For example, some people are very sensitive to dairy products or gluten or what have you and or to nightshades and can end can have inflammatory reactions to specific foods. But a high sugar diet, we know it's very, very clear that high sugar and insulin levels directly lead to this type of microscopic inflammation in the brain. One of the ways that can happen is through the creation of these things called advanced glycation end products, where too much sugar, well, if you're eating too much sugar and your blood sugar levels are too high, then your brain sugar levels will also be too high. Yeah. And what happens is the proteins and the fats and the membranes and the, the DNA, any of the structural components of the brain, those proteins and molecules can become sticky and stick to each other and form these clumps, these dysfunctional clumps. And uh -huh. they build up in the brain and they interfere with the brain's ability to function. So that is literally gumming up the works, shall we say, you know, it's one of the reasons why it's so important to keep blood sugar levels in good control. And is that gumming up the works part of the a contribution or understanding of how depression might happen because things are not, uh, the neurochemistry is not flowing as freely, whatnot? Yes, exactly. So we have a lot of hypotheses about how high sugar diets and inflammation and AGEs, these advanced glycation end products, cause problems in the brain. There are many other bridges between high sugar diets and brain damage, but this is one of the ones that's best described. And there are lots of other pathways as well, such as disruption of... So if you've got too much... One of the other things that can happen is when you have these AGEs piling up, 
the brain's response, which is a healthy response, is to respond by deliberately creating inflammation and oxidative stress. Wow. And that, that in the beginning is to try to clean up that mess. Right. To try to remove those AGEs and restore everything back to normal. But if you're eating this way three, four, five, six times a day, which most people are, then you're always in this chronic state of inflammation and you're never getting to the healing phase. So unfortunately, inflammation and oxidative stress is very damaging if you let it go for too long. It's a necessary evil to try to clean up the mess, but it's not supposed to be going on all the time. Yeah. It can literally damage the blood-brain barrier. It can literally, it, one of the things it does is it raises glutamate levels to much higher than they should be. Glutamate's a neurotransmitter in the brain that helps regulate, that affects anxiety levels, irritability, uh, insomnia, mood. Lots right. and lots of mood disorders are connected to glutamate dysfunction. So it's another bridge between inflammation and diet. Right. Wow. This is really, I want to say mind blowing, you know, and the other thing I heard you say is that in a way the brain is just doing its job, but it's doing it in a toxic environment. And so ultimately what would be good for us ends up being bad for us because we remain in this toxic environment. So those are some of the causation factors about why depression and ADHD and Alzheimer's can happen. So maybe we should move to some of the solutions. So Molly, do you want to take it from there? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you guys did a really good job setting up these are common things that happen even in our clients with food addiction, right? And I'm a mental health professional. I'm a licensed mental health and a licensed addiction counselor, right? So I kind of see all of that often and it takes everything in me to not just like jump, you know, when it's just a mental, when it's a client coming in with a mental health issue, quote unquote, to not jump in and just start asking about what they're eating because of what you guys said. And obviously I will be the first to admit, I don't understand it on the level that you two understand it, but certainly I have enough understanding to know like it's playing a role for sure. So my question then is, we know this is happening. We have evidence that's very suggestive and also showing that this is what's happening. So what is the solution, Dr. Eve? How do you work with your patients to move them away from disease and toward health? Yeah. I mean, I think that's the million dollar question, right? Because a lot of people certainly don't want to change their diet. It's very difficult. It's very difficult to change behavior of any kind, but especially eating behaviors because they're so ingrained, but it depends on who you are and what kind of practice you have or how motivated you are. So for people who are really serious, for people who are really serious about improving their mental health and are really motivated to do so because either they don't want to take a medication or they don't tolerate the medicine or the medicine hasn't worked for them or they can't afford the medicine, everybody who's out there listening, who was interested in reducing their need for medication should really the very first place to start is your diet. That is really the most important place to start. And if you're really serious about it, there's a lot you can do, a lot you can do yourself, even without the help of a professional to improve your mental health. And it really starts with something very simple, which I know both of you are hundred percent on board with is just eat real unprocessed foods. And this is extremely important. And it's much harder than it seems because most people eat a lot of food that isn't really food. And we're just used to that. And it's a big, big change. And it takes some practice. But for some people, that's all you need to do to feel yeah. better. And you don't need a medical professional to help you with that. If that doesn't work for you, then you may need to go further. You know, and so you may need to have some nutrient testing. You may need to look at your metabolic health. You may need to try a low carbohydrate diet. And in many cases, that's one of the ketogenic diets or some uh, one of the cornerstones of my particular practice. But I use many different types of dietary strategies in my practice. It's all personalized to the patient. But uh, that's where things get a little bit more complicated, where in many cases, you're going to want to have some professional support to guide you through that. But for everybody listening, just practicing eating. I mean, I, I'll say to everybody, why don't you just start with a paleo diet? It's fruits and vegetables and meat and fish and eggs and all whole foods. Uh, so a, per a person can come into your office and say, I'm struggling with anxiety or I'm depressed. And you might say to them, okay, first off, let's start with the paleo diet. 
Yes. And that is a great starting place for absolutely everybody. It's safe for children. It's safe for pregnant women. It's safe for the elderly. It's safe for people taking medications. It's safe for people who are overweight. It's safe for people who are underweight. It's safe for everyone, regardless of their health issues, because it's just real food. They're just, it's completely safe. And so, and any kind of practitioner can, can make this recommendation and be on very solid ground. And because it reduces inflammation, because in many cases, it will lower blood sugar levels to a certain extent because you've gotten all the, the foods out, the processed carbohydrates, the refined carbohydrates that give you these huge spikes and crashes in blood sugar and insulin levels and also stress hormones as a result. Because you're taking away all of that stuff, sometimes that's all that needs to happen. However, many of us, most of us now, have some degree of insulin resistance, metabolic damage, and unfortunately, for many of us, paleo type diet will include too much carbohydrate from fruits and vegetables, fruits and starchy vegetables to bring our insulin and blood sugar levels into a healthy enough range. So that's where you may need to go a step further. And so depending, and that's, yes, that's when you talk about the metabolic assessment. Can you elaborate on that a bit? Yes. So one of the things I like to say is that everybody with a mental health concern deserves a metabolic evaluation. And that's not happening right now in the vast majority of mental health offices around the world. Okay. And so, yeah. And just as if you were going to a primary care doctor concerned about diabetes or obesity or heart disease, if you go to your mental health professional, you should also have a metabolic health evaluation because the metabolism, your metabolic health affect the health of your brain. The brain metabolism is just as important, if not more so, than the metabolism, metabolic health of the rest of your body. And Thank that you. includes, mm -hmm. I'm sorry, go ahead and start to talk about And does that then make you decide, okay, so paleo is not enough. Based on this metabolic evaluation, we may have to go to keto, that sort of thing? Exactly. In a lot of cases, that's we're trying to see if that's where we need to go. So we'll look, for example, we'll look at the fasting blood sugar, of course, but we'll also look at fasting insulin levels. We'll look at the lipid profile and we'll do a lot of other very common lab tests. In some cases, it's really, really helpful if the person is willing to check their own blood sugar at home after meals, about an hour after meals, check their own blood sugar when they wake up in the morning. If they can access a continuous glucose monitor, just a patch that you put on your arm. It's a disc, a painless disc that you put on your arm for 10 to 14 days. It will trace your blood sugar readings even overnight. So you can see how the foods you're eating, whatever your diet is, whether it's paleo or Mediterranean or junk food or whatever it is, <laughs> you can actually see in real time how your food choices are, whether they're safe for your personal metabolism. And if we see that blood sugar going up too high, say to 125 or higher, especially if it's over 140 milligrams per deciliter, then that we know that that particular way of eating is not safe for your metabolism. And you can just make the assumption that that's not safe for your mental health either. Like we're just going to make that next. Yeah. 100%. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. Wow. Interesting. All right. So is there a specific diet then that you prefer? I mean, and I'm going to use the word diet in quotations for our listeners, right? That's just the agreed upon word that I feel like our society uses. But I mean, is there a preferred food or way of eating? Well, let's just put it that way. Is there a preferred way of eating that then you use with your patients or is it really very personal lies to them? Well, there's sort of three foundational diets that I use, and then those can be personalized, right? So basically, a paleo diet is sort of where everybody can start, unless they've already tried something like that, or we already know that they've got a lot of metabolic damage. But a paleo diet is one sort of step one. Step yeah. two would be, okay, if you've got some metabolic damage, your blood sugar isn't controlled by a paleo diet or a paleo diet that hasn't helped you, then we can go to a low carbohydrate version of the paleo diet where you, you take down a lot of the fruits and starchy vegetables and just eat the more of the, more of the above ground vegetables, et cetera, and maybe small amounts of fruit, but it's really mostly, mostly protein and fat and low carbohydrate vegetables. And that may do the trick, but then there's the next level is a ketogenic diet. And there's some confusion about this out there that not, it's really important that people know that not all low carb diets are ketogenic. So just by counting your carbs, it doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to get into ketosis. And mm -hmm. so, and there's a huge, there's a world of difference between a low carbohydrate diet and a ketogenic diet. And the difference is ketones. And the reason why that matters is because ketones are what fuel, what are going to fill those energy gaps in the brain 
where the brain has become, it's become more difficult for the brain to utilize glucose because there's been so much metabolic damage. So those ketones are really the key to success for quite a few people. And you need to be able to generate those ketones on your diet. And in some cases, that means making other changes to the diet beyond just counting the carbohydrates. Do you want to elaborate just a little bit more for our food addiction people, not all of whom are keto? When you're talking about this, this is not keto light anymore. This is keto serious. And this probably requires a coach or somebody to help. Can you give an example of what you mean by somebody who's so metabolically deranged that they want to use ketones instead of glucose? What would a diet like that look like? Yes, thank you. So yes, if you're going to attempt a low carbohydrate or a ketogenic diet, any diet where you're restricting carbohydrates significantly, then let's say you're restricting to 50 grams or below per day. If you're taking any medications, if you have any serious mental health symptoms, if you've had suicidal ideation in, in yeah. your life or any serious mental health symptoms or serious medical conditions, or you're taking any medications at all, it's very important to work with a practitioner who understands how low carbohydrate diets affect those health issues and those medication levels. It is just a different kind of ironically, because a low carbohydrate diet is so effective, they can cause changes to your biochemistry rather quickly when you're first adjusting to it. So that disclaimer aside, <laughs> a truly ketogenic diet where you've got the carbohydrates low enough to generate ketones and you've got your food intake low enough to generate ketones, a truly ketogenic diet is going to usually, for most people, contain about 20 grams, around 20 grams of total carbohydrate per day. And that's not net carbs, that's total carbs. Total carbs is what, for people with metabolic damage, often you need to count the total carbs. Everyone's different. So this yeah. threshold is a little different, but if I'm starting off with somebody and I don't know exactly where their threshold is, that's a pretty good place to start. It pretty reliably will get most people into ketosis, but people also have to be careful not to overeat other foods in general. So if you're you know, if you're eating three, four, five, six times a day and you're eating lots and lots of rich foods and lots of meat and lots of sauces and lots of salad and all kinds of other low carb foods, lots of nuts and cheese, you're not going to get into ketosis. It's just too much food coming in. To get into ketosis, your insulin levels need to be low and lots of things stimulate insulin, not just carbohydrates. So that's very important. So a truly ketogenic diet, it's going to be controlled amount of low carbohydrate food, and you're probably not going to be able to be eating constantly. You're probably going to eat you know, two to three meals a day at most and, and try not to be snacking. And the good news is that if you're trying to do this, the stricter you are in the beginning, the easier it is to maintain. Because when you get some ketones arising in your bloodstream, your appetite naturally comes down. And that's a huge relief for people. It's just a game changer, especially for people with food addiction for whom other plans have not worked. So everybody is different, right? And so some people don't need to go to that degree of restriction and other people do. And it's really freeing if they discover that. So this it sounds to my medical mind, like not exactly extreme behavior, but almost, I get a little bit worried about somebody doing this on their own without support, either medical or knowledgeable support. So what's your take on that? Like when somebody's getting to that level, especially when we start to using words like intermittent fasting as well, I get really nervous that people are doing this on their own. So what's your take on this? Yes. And so, especially as a psychiatrist, it's very important. And I make this point as often as I can whenever I'm speaking about this publicly is you should not do this by yourself. You need to learn about it and you need to work with somebody who understands how these diets work so that it will be safe and comfortable and a positive experience for you. And there are some people who should not eat a ketogenic diet. So um, please elaborate. <laughs> also very important. So as you may know, I teach a course for clinicians on ketogenic diets and mental health and you know how to help patients with this uh, in your practice. And so there are some people who should not eat a ketogenic diet and those include you should not start a ketogenic diet if you're already pregnant. You should not start a ketogenic diet. And we're talking about a strict ketogenic diet here, not a you know sort of a liberal low-carb diet. You yeah. should not start a, a strict ketogenic diet if you're breastfeeding. You should not start a ketogenic diet if you are taking certain medications. There's a list of them that I go over with my trainees. So and there are certain medical conditions where you should not follow a ketogenic diet. And you should not follow a ketogenic diet if you have anorexia, if you're suffering with anorexia. And so there are other exceptions as well, but those are the most important ones to mention. And really the point is, 
you can't just jump into a ketogenic diet without more information and support. So besides the anorexic, which seems kind of obvious because it's restricting food and you might enhance the restriction, what other uh, mental um, health conditions would you be cautious about uh, suggesting a ketogenic diet? Anybody in a psychiatric crisis, it's not a good time to change your diet when you're in a crisis. So anybody who's very unstable, who's uh, currently in a psychiatric crisis or who's been unstable for a long time, the problem with starting a ketogenic diet in that particular case is that there is an adaptation period of several weeks, which you know is difficult sometimes for anybody, whether you have a mental health issue or not. It can be a little bit of you have to go through some carbohydrate withdrawal. You have to your body has to go through some physiological shifts. Yeah. Those first several weeks sometimes can make people feel temporarily worse psychologically. So if you're already struggling, if you're already in a pretty fragile place it's probably not the best time to begin this journey because you might feel more anxious temporarily. You might feel more manic temporarily. You might feel more depressed temporarily. So that's another reason why it's really important to consult with somebody. Wow. I just heard you say you might feel more manic temporarily. Mm -hmm. Yes. You could actually make something worse. Uh, Yeah. Yeah. Temporarily. Yes, Yes. absolutely. Mm -hmm. Molly, I'm taking over here. Do you want to jump in? (laughs) No, That's totally fine. I'm just engrossed with the conversation that's happening in front of me. I mean, so obviously we know that there are like clinical obstacles then to using nutritional therapy. And we just heard some of them, right? Like obviously as a psychiatrist, you have client or patients who are coming to you who have some of these situations going on that you can't, right? You have to stabilize them in another way before you would start to maybe use nutritional therapy. Are there other obstacles to using nutritional therapy in psychiatry? Do you have pushback from colleagues? Are there other medical professionals reaching out to you saying, Dr. Eve, what are you doing? Like, talk to us a little bit about that, because I think our clients run into that. Mm -hmm. And so how do you as a professional deal with that? Yes, this has been a very, very common question. Uh, There's a lot of skepticism about the use of dietary strategies in mental health practice. We we want to medicate everybody. (laughs) How come people don't ask about the risks of that? I mean, I think that psychiatric medications, they're really a mixed blessing. They absolutely do help some people and they are very, very important pieces of the puzzle for some people. I have prescribed psychiatric medications for over 20 years and I have lots of experience seeing some people get much, much better. The medications can keep them out of the hospital. They can keep them in college. They can save their relationships. They can save their lives. These are very important tools. But for many people, they either don't work or they only bring a certain amount of relief or the relief they bring comes with an enormous price and not just a price tag, a cost of money, but side effects and sexual side effects, metabolic side effects, diabetes, weight gain, apathy, insomnia, sleepiness, all kinds of things that really reduce quality of life. And so that's why I think it's really important to start with food whenever feasible and see how far you can go there. Unless you're in a, you know, obviously, if you're in a crisis situation, you don't want to start with diet, but why not start with food? And that's where the brain chemicals come from in the first place. Yeah. Well, so how about trying to change your brain chemistry that way first, if you can afford the time to do so? And then you use medications as an adjunctive, sort of add on to the diet if necessary. And so that's sort of my philosophy. I may have lost track of your original question, though. <laughs> sure. Yeah. No, have you had pushback from colleagues oh. <laughs> or other referral sources in using nutritional therapy? Yes. And so I was on an expert panel uh, last summer, actually, I think it was last summer, international panel, nutritional psychiatrists and psychologists. And I think there were four or five of us on this panel. And the question that I got from a skeptical colleague was, why would you want to use such an extreme diet? Oh my God. Mental health conditions when there's no good evidence to support its Mm -hmm. use. And so I really designed the whole first module of my training program to answer that question. (laughs) And really, that module is really about, okay, here's what the science tells us. It is not true that we don't have any science to support this strategy. People have been using ketogenic diets to heal brain conditions, quite serious brain conditions like epilepsy, for 100 years And so we know that it can have healing and stabilizing properties. What's missing is we don't have the clinical trials, the rigorous clinical trials to test this diet specifically for 
individual psychiatric conditions, but those clinical trials are now underway. We've got people around the world, uh, clinical trials on anxiety, bipolar disorder, psychotic conditions, autism spectrum disorders, Alzheimer's disease. The science is coming and it's really taken off even just in the past three or four years. So, and patients aren't waiting for that science. That's really, really good news. <laughs> That's really good news. I saw actually that you had some note about uh, ketogenic diets helping for psychosis. That really surprised me that it actually can have an alter hallucinogenic uh, hallucinations. Have you had that experience? Isn't that incredible? One of the first cases and one of the best described cases that has ever been published was by Dr. Eric Westman back in 2009 of a woman who had suffered with schizophrenia and hallucinations for over 60 years. And within a number of weeks on a low carbohydrate diet was free of hallucinations um, and remains so to this day, 12, 13 years later, and and is no longer taking antipsychotic medication. So, and there've been three or four other cases published since then of other individuals who have been able to either significantly lower their medication or in some cases stop taking medication for serious psychotic illnesses. So now this is not true for everybody. These diets do not work for everyone, but they are absolutely worth trying. Things have to be closely monitored, but they're absolutely worth trying for people who are interested. Can I just ask you a question, Molly, if you don't mind? Uh, This is a question that I'm always asked about, and I just don't know what to say from a scientific point of view. Sweeteners and ADHD. Is it true that artificial sweeteners, not just sugar, but artificial sweeteners can make, that stopping them can make a change for ADHD? So one of the strongest, you may be aware of, there's quite a bit of research back in the 80s and 90s, look, trying to find out if sugar yeah. Uh, you know, worsened ADHD symptoms. Yeah. And interestingly enough, I don't know how many of your listeners are aware of this, but those studies were eventually stopped because they thought they found the answer. They thought they found, oh, sugar doesn't doesn't cause ADHD because when we take sugar out of kids' diets, it doesn't seem to get any better. Well, what were they replacing the sugar with? Right. The sugar with other refined carbohydrates. So, you know, it was like replacing Coke with Pepsi and saying, oh, well, you know, it doesn't make any difference. You know, you don't have to worry about the Coke. So, but there were also some studies with artificial artificial colorings. Yes. And, and those studies did find there seemed to be a connection between artificial colorings and ADHD. And the artificial sweeteners, and this is my personal clinical experience talking, for some people, there can be real effects on their ability to concentrate, be productive, pay attention, and even mood-wise. And it can vary from one sweetener to another. So it's very, very interesting, but I have some patients who don't do well with Splenda, some patients who don't do well with aspartame, some patients who don't do well even with things like erythritol, which you would think would be a little bit more benign. But one of the things that I do in my practice beyond the sort of foundational diets and the ketogenic diets is paying attention to people's individual food sensitivities and their reactions to specific foods. And if they're not doing well, we experiment. We do these, what I call a curiosity experiments. Like, let's find out what happens if you were to make this small change for a week or so and see if it makes a difference. Have you ever had anybody say stevia was a problem? I, just because people ask me this. So I know there's somebody out there wondering. Yes, exactly. And so this depends on the person. So for example, I personally do not do well with stevia. It gives me a headache. I have trouble concentrating and I feel unwell for the rest of the day. I also don't happen to like the taste of it, but it's uh, but that's just just an end of one. That's just me. But all of my patients are a little bit different. Some of them do beautifully with sweeteners, even the artificial sweeteners, and others do not. For some, it kicks up cravings, and for others, it doesn't. For yeah. some, you know, it brings their ketone levels down, and for others, it doesn't. And so, this is where the sort of the beauty of believing the patient, and also for us to keep an open mind. I mean. As you know, Dr. Tarman, working with people who take medications, how many times have patients come to you saying that they'd seen another practitioner who had told them that a particular medicine couldn't possibly be the cause of whatever their side effect is that they're having because it's not in the book? Yeah. Well, of course, that medicine was never tested on that patient. And so the only way we know how something affects someone is to actually try it. And something else I know listeners may be interested to hear or may already know is that there are no reliable tests for food sensitivities, unfortunately. And much as some manufacturers would have you believe that there are, 
have you spent hundreds of dollars on specialized food sensitivity testing? There's only one way to really know, and that's to take it out and put it back in. Mm -hmm. And it's not fun and it's not fast or easy, but it is very, very illuminating. So I, for example, I had a patient tell me back in January, she'd had panic attacks, almost daily panic attacks for decades. And, you know, so I've seen all kinds of therapists, seen all kinds of medication, would take clonazepam with her, clonopin with her wherever she went because she had these panic attacks so frequently. It turned out to be eggs. Oh my God. She didn't have, <laughs> she said, she said, when I think of all the money I spent on therapists talking about my childhood, when all I had to do was stop eating eggs. <laughs> yeah. Wow. You just never know. And these types of food and mood connections, I find really personally quite fascinating But also I have to say they're unpredictable. And so that's why the keeping an open mind and not just going by the research studies, there's no research study out there that's going to tell you that eggs cause panic attacks. Yeah. So that's where I say, you know, anything is possible. (laughs) We would be remiss not to, can you give your statement on food addiction? Because we are all about food addiction. So what's your stand there? Well, I can also say I identify as a food addict myself. And so this is a personal as well as professional. I don't know if I have a, a textbook a definition for you that I use, but basically an unhealthy preoccupation with mm. food that interferes with your quality of life and that interferes with your goals and that is causing you health problems, social, physical, psychological health problems that you do not want. And if you're eating foods that are impairing your quality of life, and you don't have control over that. I mean, that's the thing. If you can't stop, then that's an addiction. Great. Thank you. And I bet you most of the people listening could probably nod to all of those features that you said. Yeah, great. Can I ask you about your take? Because I saw you had a, an opinion about this on plant-based diet versus the, unfortunately, it's plant-based versus keto. But what do you do with somebody who says, I want to be plant-based vegan? And there they are, and they're struggling with metabolic disease and depression. Well, it is really unfortunate, thanks for pointing this out, that somehow keto and plant-based have become opposite ends of the spectrum. There's no need for that. You can eat a ketogenic diet and eat a vegan diet. That's possible to do. It's a little more difficult, but you can do it. And you can very easily eat a ketogenic vegetarian diet. So it doesn't have to have meat to be a ketogenic diet. I don't know where that idea came from. So I personally, I like to say I'm nutritionally pro-choice. So if you're coming to Love it. You want help with your mental health. I will help you no matter what kind of diet you want to eat. I will help you optimize your diet of choice. If you want to eat only plants, I'll tell you what the risks are of doing that, but I'll also help you optimize it with supplements and making better food choices. And I think the whole, I know this for a fact, that there are no studies out there. There's not been a single study showing that a vegan diet is healthier than other types of diets because that experiment has actually never been done. We do know that whole foods vegan diets are healthier than junky diets that happen to include meat. But I believe that it's the whole foods part of that definition rather than the plant-based part of that definition, which is making the difference. Until we actually have a study that puts a whole foods vegan diet head to head with a whole foods meat-based diet, we won't know the answer. But my money is on the whole foods being the most important part of that equation. So so for the vegan listeners here, what is something to be cautious about and why would you say it, it is doable? Can you give an example on both sides? And yeah. What do you have to worry about? Yes. I worked at Smith College for five years and many of the students there really preferred a vegan diet. And really what my job is, is to tell people what the risks and benefits are and how to improve their brain health using the diet of choice. So if you're eating only plants, You're not going to get all the nutrients that your brain needs. You must, must supplement. And so, for example, uh, one of the, and this goes beyond B12. I mean, I think most people who eat uh, vegetarian vegan diets know that B12 is important to supplement. But beyond that, what's really important for the brain, for example, are the omega-3 fatty acids in the proper form. So plants do not contain any EPA or DHA. They contain an omega-3 ALA, which is the wrong form. It's not the form that our brains and bodies use. And we have to jump through a lot of biochemical hoops to try to convert it into the proper form. And it's very unclear whether we are able to do that sufficiently. And it's quite clear that it's extremely difficult to do that if you're a pregnant woman, Mm -hmm. that it's very difficult to supply a baby, the developing baby, with enough 
DHA to support the developing brain if you're eating only plant-sourced omega-3 fatty acids. So that's a really good example. So can you get a nutritional, can you get a nutritional supplement to give you that or is that not really possible? Yes, only in very recent years, we now have algae sourced omega-3 DHA and EPA omega-3 fatty acids. Now algae is neither a plant nor an animal. Therefore, it kind of breaks all those rules and so is vegan friendly. So but it can't be a flaxseed supplement. It can't be from chia seeds. It's got to be if you're eating a plant-based diet and you don't want to take fish oil or eat fish, it's really important to take an algae-based omega-3 supplement. So that's a con, the fact that you might not get the essential uh, nutrients that you need. And is there something that's uh, particularly good or promising about a vegan diet? Well, one of the things I love about vegan diets is that they're dairy free. <laughs> I am somebody who does not recommend that people eat dairy. No, this is a tough one. Of course, people want to eat dairy, they can. I'm not going to stop them. But my official recommendation is to remove dairy from the diet if you want to be your healthiest, metabolically, physically, etc. But that's one of the things I actually love about vegan diets is that they're dairy free. Hey, great. Molly, I keep taking the floor here. <laughs> oh, you're fine. You know, I, just so much of what you said, Dr. E, it just reflects a lot of work that I do with my clients as far as like you were talking about the diets and not having these reliable tests for food sensitivities. And unfortunately, it's this kind of slow process of take things out and then try to reintroduce them. And so often we do the same thing with food addiction stuff. We don't always know what those trigger foods are. Like the obvious offenders, most people can, they jump right on the call and they know exactly what those red light foods are. But then we kind of get into that yellow area, right? That gray area, we're not really sure. And so we do, we have to do the same thing. We're like, oh, maybe we need to take out X, Y, or Z for a period of time and then see if we reintroduce it, how that goes. And so I think this is just a reminder for our listeners too, that a lot of times in this world of food addiction, we talk about eating for abstinence first and then for health and mental health, our brain health, everything that you're here to talk about today is absolutely that part of it. And so much of it overlaps. And this is just a really beautiful illustration for our listeners. This is exactly why we talk about it because it very much overlaps. And so the food addiction part of it. I love everything that you're saying, why you like removing dairy, all the things. One question that I do have, and this is probably just a little personal because there are many of us who have the volume addiction piece to this, Mm -hmm. where even once we remove those foods that we crave that trigger us to overeat or binge on, we may still do that with the Brussels sprouts, with the steak and Dr. Saivas was on and he's like, I don't believe that happens. And I said, okay, that's great. However, I know that happens. You know, how do you work with those patients or what would you say to our listeners about that? Yes, both of you are asking such important questions. And it's clear that both of you have a lot of clinical experience because that's where these questions are coming from. They're coming from the real world. And the real world is not always in textbooks or part of these dramatic dietary corners that people will find themselves in sometimes. And so here's, I use a word a lot with my folks who are struggling with food addiction. I use the word guardrails. And so whatever diet we're working on, if someone has a volume addiction or an emotional addiction to eating, we have to put in some guardrails because if I say, oh, all you have to do is bring your carbs down to 20 total a day, that is not enough containment. That's not enough. Mm. It's not safe to say, well, you can have as much steak as you want, or you can have as much cheese as you want, or you can have as many eggs as you want, or as much broccoli as you want. That is not going to work for people with a volume or emotional addiction. That's how you can gain weight on a keto diet, right? Oh, yes. And I have. So, and many of my clients have as well, because it's not just about the carbs. It is about how much food you're eating. (laughs) Weight is about how much food you're eating. And so if you give people free reign, not only is that not helpful, it actually doesn't feel safe to people. They feel like there's not enough containment. And so for a lot of people, and for better or for worse, there needs to actually be a prescribed plan. Here's how much you have at breakfast. Here's what you can have at lunch. Here's what we have at dinner. Some people find that incredibly safe and reassuring and freeing in a certain way. It frees them from having to worry about how much can I eat of this? Is it okay for me? Some people can't tell if they're hungry or not because all of those internal signals have been damaged and they can't really trust. And those are the people that would would do well on a weight and measured plan. Exactly. Yeah. All right. 
Well, thank you so much for clearing that up for me with how you work with patients of your own on that. that it sounds like it wouldn't just be like saying count your carbs. It would also be a, there's going to be a prescribed amount. So what do you think, Vera? Should we wrap this up or did you yeah. have other well, things in your, okay. As one of my, as one of the wrap up questions, I was really interested, um, Dr. Eden, the fact that you're doing a lot of training up for clinicians on sort of how to use nutrition as a um, mental intervention. So can you talk a little bit about what kind of training you have coming up? Because I bet you people are interested. Is it just for clinicians? Is it for people who are interested in becoming food addicts? Is it only doctors? Like, just give a little bit about that. Sure. (laughs) Yes. So the training is, it is for clinicians of all backgrounds. Uh, It doesn't matter what your credentials are, your experience is, all clinicians are welcome. It is uh, CME approved and continuing education approved by the ANA for nutrition specialists, as well as for physicians, uh, physician assistants, nurses, nurse practitioners through the AFP. And I'm running, there's small live online classes, small groups, six, six clinicians per group. And I'm running the last groups that I'll be running in 2021 will be in September. There are going to be four uh, groups starting up. I actually just sent out an announcement about this, like the schedule for people to choose from. And so if people are interested, uh, I'd love to hear for your questions about it. I'm happy to answer questions. You can just go to my website. There's a training tab on the website, Diagnosis Diet. Just on the training tab, you'll see all the information there, or you know, just contact me there and ask me if you want to. And there's a brochure that you can read. But basically, it's a five-week 90 minutes per module, 90 minutes, five consecutive weeks. And what's I've really loved about it is meeting all of these different clinicians from around yeah. the world who are interested in doing this. And some people are already using this in their practices and we learn so much from each other. And we talk about real cases and we talk about real obstacles and challenges. And I give people lots of tools, recommended lab tests and all kinds of medication manuals and all kinds of stuff. So it's... Uh, the goal here is to increase access because there are so few of us who do this kind of work and lots and lots of people who are looking for people who do this work. Oh, that's great. Thank you so much. Molly, back to you. Sure. So other than your website that we just heard about, where else can our listeners find you? Yeah. So I am on Twitter at Georgia Eat MD on Twitter. Uh, and I'm on Facebook as well at Georgia Eat MD. And I sometimes write for psychology today, but anything I write usually shows up on, on my website, Diagnosis Diet, if you're looking for the things that I'm writing. I'm working on, uh, hopefully in the next month or two, starting a YouTube channel because there are so many of people interested in this information who don't really like to read articles. <laughs> you know, they'd rather listen or watch something. And so that's something I'm hoping to have up in the next uh, month or two. Exciting. All right. Okay. Our signature question. Are you ready? We, we ask all of our guests some version of this question. It's just a thing we like to do. So if you could tell a younger version of yourself something about food, sugar, mental health, processed foods, addiction, something along those lines, like what we've been talking about today, what would it be? I really wish, you know, when I look back at my childhood where I struggled for years with just the humiliation of being overweight, which is just devastating for kids, socially devastating and psychologically devastating. I wish I had known if I could just eat real food, I probably could have prevented all the metabolic damage and all of the weight struggles that I had my whole life and still continue will always have, you know, this is a lifelong issue. And if I had just eaten whole foods from the beginning, maybe I wouldn't need to eat a low carbohydrate diet now as an adult, you know what I mean? And so I wish that kids knew what food actually is, like what foods are and what non-foods are. Most of what kids are eating are non-foods. Wow. Dr. Edie, I just want to say thank you so much for your nutritional psychiatrist really promoting the concept of using food to treat our mental health. This is a unique voice. This is a greatly appreciated voice. As we said earlier, it's not just about food addiction. It's just about mental health. And so thank you so much for your contribution and for coming onto this podcast today. Thank you, Dr. Charman. Thank you, Molly. I have really enjoyed every minute of this conversation. And I'm really glad that you invited me to talk about this and for your excellent questions and for all of your excellent work. Thank you. Thank all you right. Being here. Thanks for joining us this week on Food Junkies, Recovery from Food Addiction. Make sure to join our Facebook group, Sugar-Free for Life Support Group, I'm Sweet Enough. 
You can subscribe to our show in iTunes or Stitchers. That way you'll never miss an episode. While you're at it, if you found value in this show, we'd appreciate a rating on iTunes. Or if you'd simply tell a friend about the show, that would help us out too. Don't forget to pick up your copy of Dr. Tarman's book, Food Junkies, which is available on Amazon. If you have any additional questions, both Molly and Clarissa are food addiction professionals and work one-on-one with clients. You can find their websites and email addresses in the show notes. Be sure to tune in every Friday when our new episodes drop. As Vera loves to say, the power is ours.